God felt, God tasted and enjoyed is indeed God, but God with those gifts that flatter the human soul. God in darkness, privation, forsakenness and insensibility is so much God that it is, so to speak, God bare and low. Now, Jesus, like, can we, can we make it there where it is God in darkness? We think that when we meet God, it will be in light, but God in darkness, in privation, deprivation, total sensory deprivation, total intellectual deprivation. Supposing I imagine I'm a thermometer. Supposing I put the thermometer into water, the thermometer will tell me what the temperature of the water is, but it won't tell me whether the water is, is fluent, flowing or static, whether the water is saline or sweet, whether the water is muddy or, or bright or clear. You know, it can only tell me what the temperature of the water is. Now, I am a, I am a thermometer in this darkness and I am registering nothing. With my senses, I am registering nothing. With my mind, I am registering nothing. With my soul and in my soul, I am literally registering nothing. Now, the extraordinary thing is that this not registering anything is, is the lowest point in the dark night of the soul. And that moment of total dereliction, of total tenebrae, that moment is the moment of total exaltation. And that's the moment when I look down into my empty skull. I mean, when we quench the candles in Tenebrae, it is my f senses, my five senses that are being quenched. It's my faculties that are being quenched. It is my mind, in a sense, that is being quenched. I'm going into what they call the cloud of unknowing. And in that cloud of unknowing, in that total tenebration when the church is dark, and um, because Christ is buried behind, in the, the, uh, is the candle buried behind the altar? In that darkness, that is when, that is the darkness of God. That is, I'm never nearer to God than now. In fact, I'm so near to God now that I can't, I can't, you know, because I'm not experiencing God in my senses, I think God doesn't exist. It is in not experiencing God that God is. You have to go beyond experience of God and even a need to experience God. And then God is. Then God becomes your being. Then, then somehow you cross into the divine, you achieve divine union. God then exalts you, you know, into his own nature. So that the moment of total dereliction, in a sense, becomes the moment of total exaltation by God. And I find it extraordinary. We talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost on, you know, wisdom, understanding, and like what is so wonderful. I mean, Pentecost, the Lord save us, like Pentecost. You know, people are standing around, you know, 50 days after the ascension, and suddenly the apostles are in a room, and tongues of fire come down from heaven, and they are Pentecosted. Heavenly fire comes down into their very minds and souls and hearts and being, and lights them and enlightens them, and they speak in tongues. They are undergoing the Pentecosting. They are being Pentecosted. And we talk about the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost that comes with each tongues of fire. Wisdom comes down to you. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and the fear of the Lord. Now, these are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Whit Sunday gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Pentecostal gifts of the Holy Spirit. But we don't talk at all about the Good Friday gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Good Friday gifts of the Holy Spirit are exactly what um, Fenelon said they were. They are darkness, privation, forsakenness by God and insensibility. By insensibility he means exactly that. I am a thermometer that can't even register the temperature. I register nothing. My senses register nothing. I've come into the dark water like Sylvia Plath that is starless and fatherless. And it is in that no thingness. Now can we take the word nothingness? Can I put a hyphen between the no and the thing, and then another hyphen between the thing and the ness? I haven't entered nothing. I have entered no thingness. But no thingness doesn't mean the absence of everything. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean nihil. In fact, I have entered the all. I have entered divine ground behind. I've entered the rope behind the snake. You know, 
I have made it. I've been, I've been carried to the rope behind the snake because the rope behind the snake is divine ground behind the phenomenal world. Do you know what I mean? So that is the Good Friday experience of total dereliction, total aban- of what seems like total abandonment by God. But of course it isn't abandonment by God at all because it means that God has just withdrawn from our senses and our intellect and our faculties because we have to meet him now, not in our senses and faculties, but in the very ground of our being, which is divine ground. On our walk to Golgotha, what I'm saying is, we undergo the Narada initiation. We undergo the Narada disillusioning. We do what Newton did. We desuperimpose colour from the world. We desuperimpose the experience of sound from it. We, de- we desuperimpose the snake from the rope on the way to it. And then with Sylvia Plath, like, we enter into the dark water. And that's where Christ has been. So our journey, the disillusioning that began with Newton had already 1,500, 1,600 years earlier completed itself totally in Jesus on Golgotha. So that in some strange way, we call ourselves a secular people living in a secular world. That's how we like to understand ourselves. And yet, by paradox, by a very strange paradox, we have been journeying um, to Golgotha. Golgotha, it seems to me, the final philosophical tableau is Jesus looking down into Adam's empty skull, looking down into the total emptiness of his own skull, and of Adam's skull, the skull of the race. Now, St. Paul in Philippians 2 has that wonderful thing of the kenosis thing. You know, Jesus emptied himself, he was God, and yet he didn't hold on to be God, and he became human, he was willing to become human, but he was willing even to die the death of a criminal on the cross. So those emptying, emptying, emptying. Now supposing on Good Friday that self-emptying was carried to the point where Christ looked down into his own empty skull. It was total emptiness, as empty as if there was no mind and no world. And that was the moment when the divine pleroma could again could could now occupy the ground, as it were. Because it was now empty, God could totally occupy it. Do you know what I mean? There was nothing now obstructing God. I mean, there's a prayer you can pray on Good Friday. May I be as out of your way awake, God, as I am in dreamless sleep. In dreamless sleep, I'm out of the way, am I? I'm not saying, I want to have blue eyes, I want to be good-looking, I want to win the lotto, I want to. I want the woman down the road to be, to be in love with me. I'm not aware that there's a world. I'm not aware that I'm in a world. I'm not aware of self or other than self. Sure, I'm not in dreamless sleep. Now, supposing I could pray to God, May I be as out of your way, God, when I am awake, as I am in dreamless sleep. In other words, there's total self-abandonment to God. Like, supposing I'm on, a, on, I'm on, on, on an operating table and I have been anaesthetized. I'm not saying to the surgeon, that's it now, don't, don't, don't make that wound any longer. Don't go any deeper. Um, do it this way and do it that way. Like, I'm out of the sea in Amantai. You know, I'm not, I'm not a clerk of works. I'm not the architect of my own growing. I'm not, I'm not, like, I'm not involved in a way. Now, I arrive at a point on Golgotha when I am totally, as it were, anaesthetized. I am out of God's way. Insensibility you know, means my senses don't know what's happening, my mind don't know what's happening, I'm not registering what's happening, and yet I trust that I'm being held by God. I trust that even though I can't feel I'm being held by God, that I am being held by God. The thermometer in the water has to continue to imagine that there is water, that it is immersed in. Even though nothing of me registers that I am in God, I still must believe that I am in God, and that is when I am most astonished astoundingly in God. Do you see it like, even though I'm not registering it? Now, God bless Jesus. Like, blessings be upon him forever and ever that he came that far, that he brought humanity that far. 
that he didn't stop short with Gethsemane. Gethsemane, as I tried to explain it to you, is the total fullness. He let everything that was in him happen to him. He became everything he was. Mm. Gethsemane, in Gethsemane, Jesus is he among us who is most incarnate. He isn't just incarnate in his ego, he's incarnate in his id. He is incarnate in every last depth of his being, whether that's a dark depth or a bright depth. He is incarnate in all of his inwardness. There is no part of his inwardness in which he is not incarnate. You know what I mean? Now, so he is everything in Gethsemane. He became everything that he is, consciously and unconsciously. He became the totality of what he is. So he was the pleroma of himself in Gethsemane. On Good Friday, he became totally empty. He let everything go to the point where he looked down, in, where he came to the place of the skull and he looked down into his own empty skull and it was when he became that empty that God could occupy the ground that he previously occupied and he was now in a sense exalted into what mystics call divine union. God had now granted him the final tremendous stupendous favour of divine union. I'm talking now about the mystics who have experienced divine union. A conclusion I would want to draw from this, like, is that we think when Jesus said, when it is said in the New Testament that the veil in the temple was rent between the sixth and the ninth hour, like, the veil that was really rent, the veil in the temple was rent, but another veil was rent, and that's the veil of the human psyche, that in the way that the Red Sea opened and the children of Israel walked into the desert, the veil of your own psyche opens, the sea of your own psyche, the red sea of your own psyche opens, and you walk through the two sides of your psyche into the wilderness, into what Sylvia Plath calls the dark water lake. You, we walk into that. And now we know that mind or psyche always was availing. It was, you know, avail and it veiled. And I can now draw the conclusion, I mean, I can sometimes say, look at that window. That window is a transparency. And I can be aware, of, because I look through the transparency, I can be aware of what's in the next room. Now, I sometimes think of my psyche as a transparency like that, as the window. But in actual fact, far from the psyche being a window, it is the blind. And it is only when I open the blind, when, only when the blind opens like the Red Sea opens, and I go into the total nothingness and the total darkness of what looks like nothingness and what looks like darkness, um, when I'm undergoing the dark night of the soul and the dark night of the mind and the dark night of the senses, um, this wonderful phrase by St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul, on Good Friday we inherit these major metaphors, the dark night of the soul and the cloud of unknowing, um, and we go into that darkness. I now can say that conscious and unconscious psyche is the blind, not the window. And it's only when I'm, when I'm willing to let the blind open in the way that the Red Sea opened and I go into the nothingness, the no-thingness, that I discover that that no-thingness is the fullness and not only is the fullness, it's the divine ground. So I've gone beyond the snake back into the rope. So have you a sense, like, of, again, of the stupendousness of the Good Friday experience? The biggest words we can speak as Christians are three simple words, but enormous words, the word Gethsemane, the word Golgotha, and the word Garden of the Sepulchre, if you like, you know. Um, you know, if we could learn those three words, then we would have some sense of, up to the extent that we learn them, is the extent we, to which we're going to have some experience of what Christianity is about, because it's on them, I think, on those three days that Christianity is founded. It is from there that Christianity derives its, its existence and will continue to draw and derive its existence. And people now talk about the church being in trouble. It isn't the church so much that's in trouble, it is Christianity that's in trouble. And Christianity is in trouble only because we haven't been able to comprehend or understand something of what those three simple words might mean, Gethsemane, Good Friday, and the Garden of the Sepulchre. So we wake up back in the world. Hindus and Buddhists, Zen Buddhists say, when they want to describe the spiritual journey, first there is a mountain, first there is a world. 
then there is no mountain, then we've entered the dark, the nothingness, and then again there is a mountain. Like, you know, so I lose the world and enter the nothingness, and then again I open my eyes on Christ, there is a world. So can I just want to say that the disillusioning isn't the end of the journey. I mean, I've written this, so can I just write like the, the little bit that I have here? Um, this is the way I put it, like, you know, on Golgotha, on Good Friday, the far fields and the near fields, the far mountains and the near mountains did let Jesus through to a dark water. They let him through into what, at the first encounter, must have seemed like the great knot behind what Hindus call Maya, behind what Ishmael calls the mystical cosmetic. That's one way of putting it. Alternatively, we could say that he underwent the great disillusioning. In other words, it wasn't so much that the hills let him through, as that his psyche opened in the way that the Red Sea opened, and there he was in what seemed to be the great nothingness. This didn't only happen to Jesus. It has happened to innumerable others. And it is here that the rope snake parable and the Narada parable begin to make sense. It is here that we open our door to an interpretation of the fall that sees the tempter coiled about an Amanita muscaria mushroom, the mushroom ancient Hindus call King Soma, the mainstay of the heavens. Um, so that you won't get that. But anyway, um, can I just say, like, the disillusioning that began with Newton completed itself 1,600 years earlier on Golgotha, hanging there in the seeming knot, looking down into the emptiness of his own empty skull, Christ cried out in that moment of awful dereliction, which by God's grace has for many been a moment of awful exaltation. And that second awful is spelled A-W-E hyphen F-U-L. So will I read that sentence to you again? Hanging there in the seeming knot, looking down into the emptiness of his own empty skull, Christ cried out in that moment of awful dereliction, which, by God's grace, has for so many been a moment of awful exaltation. Exaltation into the divine mirum. Mirum means, it's our word to admire, and the Spanish word mira, mira. I mean, mira, mira, look at the wonder, like the divine mirum. It's a way of saying we, don't, we can't talk at all about God, like call it the divine mirum. It is beyond anything we can say, so we'll call it the divine mirum. So our moment of awful dereliction becomes our moment of awful exaltation. Exaltation into the divine mirum. Exaltation into that same mirum, appearing to us now as evening and morning the first day and that eve day. Do you get the point like there? That, you know, first there is a mountain, then there is no mountain, then again there is a mountain. I mean, I lose the world in the darkness of Good Friday, and then suddenly I experience the divine mirum, God alone and without a second, beyond duality. I experience that. I experience divine union. And then suddenly the empty skull becomes the normal head that it normally was. And I open my eyes and I see the same mirum and experience the same mirum now, not as God in God's, in God's transcendence. I see that, experience that same mirum now in God's imminence because God is somehow imminent in the world. I experience it as evening and morning the first day. And that's what Easter morning is. It is evening and morning the first day. It is again the first day of the world. I mean, Easter isn't something that takes place like outside of myself. Easter is something that takes place inside of myself. Easter isn't a new world. It is a new way of seeing the old world. So have you a sense like of what the Good Friday experience will be about, you know, something stupendous? I've talked about the Gethsemane experience as a step in evolution. I think of it as a second last step in evolution. And I think of Good Friday experience as, in a sense, the last step in evolution. But what it is, in fact, is release from evolution. We transcend everything in us that is capable of evolving. We've gone beyond the snake into the rope. So we have transcended in, we've transcended evolution.
So when modern humanity thinks that we are going the way of evolution by going to the moon and Mars, and maybe if we can, you know, send news of ourselves to other galaxies, the way to walk the way of evolution is to walk with Christ across the Cadron into Gethsemane, is to undergo the total integration of Gethsemane and to undergo the transcendence of evolution in Good Friday. So Bright Angel Trail that takes us down to the floor of the Grand Canyon and that same trail that brings us to the summit of Golgotha, that trail coming up and that, that trail going down and that trail coming up, that's where evolution of our planet is going. And it was in the person of Jesus in Gethsemane on Good Friday that evolution took its final two steps. The step called Gethsemane and the step called Golgotha. So far from being threatened by Darwin and modern science, Christianity should be able to proclaim itself as the place to which modern science, instead of we trying to, instead of Christianity trying to catch up with science, science should be trying to catch up with Christianity. Um, instead of being afraid of Darwin, Darwin should it's Darwin who has the making up to do. And it's going to be a long journey, Charles, Charles Darwin, and God bless you, Darwin. It's going to be a long old journey from Galapagos to Golgotha. There are three Gs. There's Galapagos, there is uh, Gethsemane, and there's Golgotha. And there's even another G, Dom. <laughs> Dom. Can we go back further? On the, the northern shore of Lake Superior, there, there's rocks called the, Gun, the Gunflint Churts. Um, very old rocks, and there are rings on these rocks, Dom, I don't know if you've seen photographs of them, there are rings on these rocks, and they are now regarded, they are the oldest rocks in the world, and they are regarded as the oldest living fossils in the world, they are algae um, that formed little cones or domes, and we see the rings of them hugely compressed, but there they are, these rings. Now, supposing we talk about the Gunflint Churts, Galapagos, Gethsemane, and Golgotha, those four G's, they are all verses in the same song. The, un the song of the earth is one song. And the first verse, if you like, you know, we can say, it, we can start, we, because we have to start somewhere, start with the Gunflint flint Church. We came as far as the iguanas of Galapagos and the, the finches of Galapagos who underwent evolutionary change. And we come from there to Gethsemane and we come from there to Golgotha. So that the Christian story is a part of the evolving earth. That the earth is undergoing, in the way that the earth was undergoing, shall we say, evolution in the Gunflint Church and was undergoing evolution in Galapagos. It is still undergoing evolution in Gethsemane and is undergoing evolution or a transcendence of evolution on Golgotha. So far from the Christian story being a superimposition on the earth, like something alien brought in, it is actually growing up out of the earth. The Christian story is, a, is an, an evolutionary blossoming of the earth. And that is a way, I think, that we should learn to tell. Far from being frightened by evolution, we should be able to throw a lifeline to evolution because Christ is a person in whom the evolving earth has taken its last two steps. And so to watch with Jesus isn't just to watch with humanity or to watch with the God-man. It is to watch with the evolving earth. To watch with Jesus, to watch with that whole is to be part of that song that's that from the Gunflint Church, one verse of which is the Gunflint Church, the other of Galapagos, the other Gethsemane, the other Good Friday. So the Christian story, like, is native to the earth. It isn't something that came in from the heavens. It is a coming up out of the earth. I mean, Christ did go down to the floor of the Grand Canyon, but then he came back up and the, every sea floor came with him. And they came with him as far as the Gunflint Church, they came with him as far as Galapagos, they came with him as far as Gethsemane, and they came with him as far as Good Friday, or Golgotha. So that the whole earth has undergone the passion and death of Christ, in a sense. Because he, as I was saying earlier, was a Vishva Yuga, he was Vishva Rupa, he was, he was the omniform, he was every age, you know, he was all the old seafloors. 
And I sometimes love the idea like of Jesus going down, going down Bright Angel Trail with Bright Angel going walking with him and saying, fear not, and Jesus going down to the floor of the Grand Canyon. And as he's cupping his hands to drink this thing way above him in the strata above him, Archeornis has lifted off and is flying above him and still further above him again in some other floor is all Neanderthal eating bear brains or Neander- a group of Neanderthals living in a cave up there like they have they have clubbed an old bear to, to death like and they're eating the, the the brain and all that is happening above him like above Jesus Archeornis the first bird flying you know above him millions and millions and millions of years above him flying and yet he's drinking it all below there and that's where Gethsemane took place there is nothing more tremendous that we can talk about than our trans destiny. The Jainas of India, they aren't a numerous sect, but they're still very strong in their beliefs. They talk about Mahavira, who was their hero, round about the time of the Buddha. Mahavira meaning the great hero. Um, but they have had... Tirthankaras, they call their saviors Tirthankaras. Savior isn't the word. They're great beings. They call them Tirthankaras. Tirtha is the Hindu word for a ford in a river. And a Tirthankara is someone who actually makes a ford in the river so that we cross out of time into eternity. We can cross the river to the far shore. Now, Jesus, in that sense, was a Tirthankara. He crossed the Cadron. He crossed through Gethsemane and through Good Friday into the far shore that we call Easter. So he's a Tirthankara. He found the way. Jesus himself says, I am the way. And I, in, in my sacramental and baptismal identification with him, also, like, you know, become that, grow into that way with him, sacramentally with him. So he not only is the way, he found the way and walked the way back home to divine ground. So if someone found a way for us out of our suffering, out of our destitution, out of our dereliction, we'd say, Christ, what a great fellow, like he blazed the trail, he found the way. Jesus found the evolutionary way. He found the way for the evolving earth. The evolving earth took its last two evolutionary steps in Jesus. They're called Gethsemane and Golgotha. So God bless you, Jesus, and God bless you. God bless the God who is willing to come down and endure all that for us. Because like I talked about leading the swan, and the question Yeats asked at the end of that poem was, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent bee could let her drop? There is another question that we could ask at the end of that poem. Did he, the brutal raping God, did he put on her brokenness? Did he put on her pain? Did he put on her fragility? Did he put on her sense that she was ruined? Did he put on her sense of her own ruination? Now, if God put on her sense of ruination, then we could say that God is the kind of God who will understand us. Do you know what I mean? That he'll understand what it's like to be us, what it's like to be broken. Now, this is exactly what the God in the Christian story did. He put on the ruination. He put on the brokenness. He put on the fragility. He put on the vulnerability. He put all of that on. He became the leader. He became the broken girl walking away. And a thousand years later, or say 900 years later, there was someone walking the mountainsides of Schlieve Fuit. And he was looking, not maybe he was looking for Barnaul's Dam and looking for uh, all the kind of wildlife in Ireland. And he was looking for little herbs like that he could bring home and put into his pot and brew them so that he wanted to get the inks and the colours with which he could paint the word of God called the Book of Kells, you know. That was happening, you know, 
900 years later, 1100 years later, there was 500 hammer taps in Shard Cathedral, people hammering stones and turning them into one of the great glories of Christendom, you know. And it's because Christ was willing to undergo that bruising that we have the Book of Kells and we have all that kind of stuff. In the way that Leda carried in her womb, Greek tragedy, the plays of Aeschylus, Sophocles in Euripides and the Parthenon, Christ now was, was carrying in his womb, in a sense, Shat Cathedral and the Book of Kells and the Art of Chalice, and he was carrying the glories of Christendom in his womb, but he was the one that was willing to be the leader. Isn't it astonishing that God was willing to be the leader, the one who suffered? You know, and he suffered in Gethsemane and suffered in Friday, and he found the ford. In the great river that we couldn't swim across, he became that ford and found that ford so that we can now walk in his footsteps. He has found the way. Isn't that astonishing good news? That he has found the way? As simple as that. Just as I was getting up, I, I just had an image of Jesus again, you know. I mean, what a... What a stupendous place to find yourself in below at the foot of the Grand Canyon with all the seafloors above you or to imagine Jesus as the Vermont colt, colt, the young colt in a peaceful valley in Vermont and the buffalo robe of all our terrors, of our Kynozoic terrors, Mesozoic terrors and Paleozoic terrors, that buffalo robe shaken behind you but not so much even shaken behind you, that buffalo robe coming up out of you you know, like the little chick carrying the image of the hawk uh, in its mind and we carrying in our psyche all those ancient terrors and being possessed by those ancient terrors. And then Jesus the next day, like, it makes him very vulnerable, doesn't it? Like as as a colt in, 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 in a peaceful valley in Vermont. And then Jesus the next day as looking down into the empty skull, hanging there, looking down into the empty skull. And that is the moment of total dereliction and the moment of great exaltation. And maybe we should... Some people have experienced exaltation, that exaltation, and maybe we could look at a couple of them. Pascal was a great mathematician, a great thinker and a Frenchman, and uh, lived in the 17th century. And... After he died, his housekeeper was going through his effects and uh, she came upon his waistcoat um, and she was going through the pockets of it and she was finding things and then she felt and she felt there was something in the lining so she undid the lining and stitched the lining and she found a piece of parchment with an account of a mystical experience, an account of what we can call the, the Good Friday Exaltation. It's in French here, but I'll, I'll translate it as I read it into English. The year of grace, 1654, Monday the 23rd of November, the day of St. Clement, Pope and Martyr, and of others in the Martyrology, the eve of St. Chrysogonus, Martyr, and of others, and then the famous line, in French, depuis environ dix heures et demi du soir, jusqu'aux minuit et jusqu environ minuit et demi feu from about half past ten in the evening until about half past midnight, fire. Now, this is divine fire. Um, Jude, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, not the God of the philosophers and the scientists. Certainty, 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 feeling, joy, peace. Oubli du monde et toward me Dieu forgetfulness of the world and of everything outside of God. And then he goes on to talk about joie, 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 plaire de joie, joy, 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 tears of joy. Now, a man had this extraordinary experience for, from half past ten to half past midnight, like two hours in which he existed in the fire of God, you know. And there was total forgetfulness of the world while he was in this fire and that is something like the final exaltation. Um, he was in the life of glory that the mystics have talked about. Um, he was privileged with divine union. Can I just go back a few centuries now and quote Suzo, who had a similar experience? Suzo was one of the great Rhineland mystics. Um, the Rhineland mystics, usually we talk about Eckhart and Tauler and Suzo, and uh, further north you talk about Riesbrook and Marguerite Perrette and Hadovic. 
But Suzo was a Dominican and one of the great. Um, and one day he was feeling desolate and disconsolate and he walked into the church and sat in his choir stall and something wonderful happened. He calls himself the Servitor. Uh, he's the one who serves. So will I just read that to you? Um, in the first days of his... He talks in the third person. He's talking about himself, but it's in the third person. In the first days of his conversion, it happened upon the feast of St. Agnes, when the convent had breakfasted at midday, that the serv servitor went into the choir. He was alone, and he placed himself in the last stall on the prior's side. And he was in much suffering, for a heavy trouble weighed upon his heart. And being there alone, and devoid of all consolations, no one by his side, no one near him, of a sudden his soul was wrapped in his body, or out of his body. Then did he see and hear that which no tongue can express. That which the servitor saw had no form, neither any manner of being. Yet he had of it a joy such as he might have known. In the seeing of all the shapes and substances of all joyful things, his heart was hungry yet satisfied. His soul was full of contentment and joy. His prayers and hopes were all fulfilled, and the friar could do naught but contemplate the shining brightness, and he altogether forgot himself and all other things. Was it day or was it night? He knew not. It was as it were a manifestation of the sweetness of eternal life in the sensations of silence and of rest. Then he said, If that which I see and feel be not the kingdom of heaven, I know not what it can be. For it is very sure that the endurance of all possible pains were but a poor price to pay for the eternal possession of so great a joy. This ecstasy lasted from half an hour to an hour, and whether his soul were in the body or out of the body he could not tell. But when he came to his, sense, came to his senses, it seemed to him that he had returned from another world, and so greatly did his body suffer in this short rapture that it seemed to him that none, even in dying, could suffer so greatly in so short a time. The servitor came to himself moaning, and he fell down upon the ground like a man who swoons, and he cried inwardly, heaving great sighs from the depth of his soul, and saying, O oh my God, where was I, and where am I? And again, O oh my heart's joy, never shall my soul forget this hour. He walked, but it was but his body that walked, as a machine might do. None knew from his de demeanour that which was taking place within, but his soul and his spirit were full of marvels. Heavenly lightnings passed and repassed in the deeps of his being, and it seemed to him that he walked on air and all the powers of his soul were full of those heavenly delights. He was like a vase from which one has taken a precious ointment, but in which the perfume long remains. And it goes on. But um, this Pascal, you can just imagine him sitting down one night and suddenly fire. like, And he names the day and he names the night and suddenly there is fire. And then Suzo... And he lives in the fire and there's total forgetfulness of the world. And now there is Suzo with heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the deeps of his being. Like when we look in, when we think of ourselves, we think of we are what we biologically are or we are at a stretch what we psychologically are. But these mystics have come back and they are telling us that the Lord saves us whatever it is we are. We have, by divine grace, access to enormities, to, to splendours, to a life of glory, quite simply. And these people talk about it. And if I, would, I, if I may, can I quote from Suzo again? Um, he keeps coming, he quite often comes back to this. So can I just quote again from Suzo, describing what the Easter experience is that awaits us all, um, that God apparently has in store for us all. Again, he talks about the servitor. Lord, tell me, says the servitor, what remains to a blessed soul which has wholly renounced itself? And the, the truth speaks the answer. When the good and faithful servant enters into the joy of his Lord, he is inebriated by the richnesses of the house of God, for he feels in an ineffable degree that which is felt by an inebriated man. He forgets himself, he is no longer conscious of his selfhood, he disappears and loses himself in God and becomes one spirit with him, as a drop of water which is drowned in a great quantity of wine. For even as such a drop disappears, taking the colour and the taste of wine, so it is with those who are in full possession of blessedness. 
all human desires are taken from them in an, ind in an indescribable manner. They are wrapped from themselves and are immersed in the divine will. If it were otherwise, if there remained in the man some human thing that was not absorbed, those words of scripture which said God must be in all would be false. His being remains, but in another form, in another glory and in another power. I mean, this lovely image of the drop of water, the individual drop of water that I am, drowned in a great quantity of wine, and I take on the nature of the wine and the colour of the wine and the existence of the wine. I mean, this is, this is wonderful. I mean, well, I mean it's, it's a bit stupid to say that it's wonderful because, of course, it is wonderful. <laughs> I mean, if we listen to Marguerite Perret, she's another, if you like, of the Rhineland mystics of the north um, from a more northerly direction, but she's one of the mystics. And she, again, uh, talks about um, not so much the final stage. Here she's talking about more or less the next to the final stage, but this is itself a wonder. I mean... Isn't that marvellous? Like, this is a wonder to her, and she has become a wonder. She goes on and she talks about, it is like being in God without being oneself. Again, you have this, this thing of ceasing to be, um, of ceasing to be self. And this is what Eckhart says. Um, if I can quote from Eckhart, what he would describe as the moment of total exaltation. Comes then the soul into the unclouded light of God, it is transported so far from creaturehood into nothingness that of its own powers it can never return to its faculties in its former creaturehood. Once there, God shelters the soul's nothingness with his uncreated essence, safeguarding its creaturely existence. The soul has dared to become nothing and cannot pass from its own being into nothingness and back again, losing its own identity and process, except God safeguarded it. I mean, to be sheltered in my nothingness, to be sheltered in God, by God, to be sheltered in God's uncreated essence. I mean, what are they talking about? Like, and I mean, modern, the modern world tells us like that we are just, that we are just what we biologically are, that we just are what we psychologically experience ourselves to be. And of course, there's a beyond the psyche and there's a beyond what we are biologically. There is in store awaiting us all a night of fire. There is a noon of heavenly lightnings that Suzo experienced. I mean, if, it, if Pascal had a night of fire, then there is a chance that God will also be gracious to others of us and will grant us that exaltation into the night of fire and will grant us Suzo's noon of heavenly lightnings, heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the deeps of his being. And um, Eckhart himself, who's usually... Um, fairly cold in these things. Listen to, I mean, he's usually fairly cool, Eckhart is. Listen to him finally breaking into rapture, wonder. Oh, wonder of wonders, cries Eckhart, when I think of the union of the soul has with God. He makes the enraptured soul to flee out of herself, for she is no more satisfied with anything that can be named. The spring of divine love flows out of the soul and draws her out of herself into the unnamed being, into her first source, which is God alone. I mean, Eckhart, you know, in a state of rapture. She, um, you remember Teresa of Avila, the day when, you know, the angel came and speared her with the golden spear, with the fire, like, and she experienced the rapture. And Marguerite Perrette that I've just quoted from, she talks about being drunk on the wine I cannot drink. I mean, what marvellous states are they talking about? Like, to be drunk <laughs> on the wine I cannot drink. Now, like when Eliot wrote His Wasteland and talked about life in the modern wasteland and said it's the reductionist's life, it's life reduced to birth, copulation and death. I mean, we're born, we have sexual experience, but sexual experience for us is just copulation. It isn't, it isn't the kind of experience that the Shulamite um, would have with her shepherd when she's able to say, I am the Rose of Sharon, I am the Lily of the Valleys, and like, the, like an apple tree among the trees of the wood is my beloved unto me, I sat down under his shade, his shade and his fruit.
fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. Stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. She has experienced the rapture and the wonder of love, and there is no copulation, even in the horizon. You know, I mean, copulation isn't part of this experience at all, you know, but she's still experiencing the love, the Shulamite, the love of the Shulamite for her shepherd. And every one of us is a Shulamite in relation to God because because God, the soul is female. And um, there is what they call bride mysticism, you know, that um, that the soul becomes the bride of God. I mean, you've gone below you've gone below male and female in a sense, but in a sense the soul is female. In the sense the soul is totally passive now, in the divine exaltation. The soul isn't doing anything. All the work now is the work of God, and. Reesbrook has written this marvellous book called The Adornment of the Spiritual Marriage in French is L'Orne de Nos Spirituel um, like that we are being prepared for a mighty nuptials for a wonderful night of marriage nos when we will undergo spiritual betrothal what St. Teresa of Avila calls spiritual betrothal but the Lord save us, like, what are they talking about? Like, you're betrothed not just to a shepherd, you're betrothed, betrothed to God, like, and you are being dressed in the virtues, you are being dressed in humility, you are being dressed in charity, you are being dressed in hope, you are being dressed in the radiance, like, I mean, Teresa of Avila herself was dressed by the Virgin one evening, one day, like, you know, and dressed in a white robe and she says don't don't call it white because white doesn't name what it was it was of such a splendor and such a radiance that no earthly color at all can even be a metaphor for what this 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 robe she dressed me in and she put on a necklace of jewels on me now here's the virgin mary um you know robing trees of avila and don't think of rubies, she's saying, and don't think of chalcedony, don't think of onyxes, and, you know, because these jewels were of an unearthly nature, you know. Now, that happens. That happens. But there's, there's so much in us and so much in the world out there that is telling us, like, that we just are what we biologically are, like, you know, that I am... There are people who will say we are what we eat, you know, that I came home from a supermarket, I am I am care of Queensworth or courtesy of Queensworth or courtesy of some other supermarket, like, do you know what I mean? And yet here are these people who are coming back and telling us that there is something vast and marvellous and wonderful in store for us, you know, comes then, the, listen to that line, comes then the soul into the cloud, into the unclouded light of God. Um... I mean, depuis environ dix heures et demi du soir jusqu'à minuit et demi, feu. Between half past ten in the evening and half past and an, half an hour after midnight, fire. Sue's are talking about, you know, heavenly lightnings passing and repassing in the deeps of his being. What is Marguerite Perret talking about when she says, I am the, the river like the muse of the ooze and I am just going into the ocean and I'm in the arms of the ocean and I've that ocean is an ocean of love and I have become that love and I am a wonder to myself and this is a wonder. I mean, that is our final destination. That is the final moment in our trans-terrentum destiny. But we can't stay in the night of fire while we're still incarnate. We come out of the night of fire, we come out of our noon of heavenly lighting, lightnings, we come away and come back down from what Teresa of Avila calls her transverberation. Um, we come back and are a river again, and we are back in the, in the normal world, and it is, if you like, Easter morning. The morning we come back. And um, I sometimes think there are two Easter's. There is an Easter in which... Um, you're back now into the kind of public Easter, if you like, as opposed to the private Easter of your night of fire and noon of heavenly lightnings. You're back into the world now again. And it seems to me that this coming back into the world, there are two Easters. There's an Easter in which I awaken to the extraordinary. Um, Jesus can pass through a wall, like our... Um, he can, miracles happen. I come back into a world where miracles continue to happen. 
Um, there can be an ascension, there can be an assumption into heaven. I got, the laws of gravity are beaten all the time. Like, you know, nature is miracle. Nature is all miracle. Miracles are happening. Where formerly there were laws of nature, now there are miracles of nature. So I come back into the extraordinary. I think there is an even greater Easter, and that is the Easter in which I awaken to the ordinary. And I think the highest sanctity that is available to us while we are still incarnate and short of the divine exaltation, what we experience in the divine exaltation, short of that, the greatest blessedness on earth is to have a capacity for ordinariness, to be able to live the ordinary world. I mean, Blake talked about, you've been quoting him, uh, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Um, you know, to have a capacity to see an ordinary primrose or an ordinary sod of turf, like or an ordinary egg or an ordinary tree or an ordinary star, to have the... and to be happy with this capacity for ordinariness, to not forever be lusting after the extraordinary. I mean, I sometimes think that God must must be heartbroken because, because he, there's a world in which we live, like, and even if it's epistemologically a snake in a rope, it is still in some way a world. There is still a snake in the rope, you know. There is still a world, even if the world is a world that lives in divine ground and lives and moves and has its being in divine ground, we still experience a world. And we seem not to be satisfied with it a lot, you know. There are eternal longings in us like there are in Cleopatra. But I think it is a marvellous Easter morning any morning I wake up and I open my the blinds of my window, draw the curtains, and Christ, there's the ordinary world. What miracle could be greater than to wake up in front of Mangerton Mountain, to wake up in front of Tark Mountain, to walk out and to see a primrose? And if you look down into the heart of a primrose, you know, the, the Buddhist talk, the Tibetan Buddhist talk about the jewel at the heart of a lotus. The lotus flower has its roots in the mud at the bottom of a pond. It has a stem in the water and then it opens out into the air and the sunlight um, it, 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 resting on the water. Um, and they will talk about that lotus, that I can be lotus born that I can rise up from the mud of the passions up through the water element and open out to the light of God, to the grace of heavens pouring down into me. And then you look into the heart of that lotus and you see a jewel at the heart of that lotus and the purity of that. Now, look into an ordinary primrose and you'll see the same purity. I mean, there is, there is, there is a ravishing purity at the heart of a primrose or at the heart of a daffodil. I mean, to look into those places and to say, that's not enough, I want something more. That's being greedy, isn't it? Couldn't we learn to start and to live for a few days even with what's given? And what's given is astounding. The lion is marvellous and tremendous and a terror to me and a fear to me and a fright to me. And there's the holiness of my fear of the lion. And there is the dread. I mean, these emotions, panic, fear, dread, why can't they be holy? I mean, we might experience them as unpleasant, but why can't they be holy? Like, And to have a capacity, and I think this is what Job had to learn. You know, the whole book of Job is, in a sense, humanity. In Job, humanity is learning to be able for the ordinary world. Job com comes out behind, from behind his city wall, and he experiences behemoth. Behold, now behemoth, God says to him, behold, ostrich, behold, leviathan. He has to behold the terrors of the world. And if I could live, if I could really surrender my fear of my own dying, surrender my fear that I might die, I might be devoured, I might be killed, and run the risk of that and come out into the world that is still terrifying. There is a paradise. I think that world is also paradisal. Do you know what I mean? That to eliminate terror and danger from the world, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe there's a condition in which there is no terror and there is no fear, and clearly there is. But to live at that level where there is terror and there is fear and there is danger and it's real danger and you can be killed. There is the story of the Buddha, two Buddhas, two potential Buddhas um, walk on the road one day 
and they're both seeking enlightenment and they're both equally fervent about seeking enlightenment and a hungry tigress walks past them and they realise that she is on her last legs and she's, she has found, she's been on the hunt all day and she has found no food for her cubs and she will die and her cubs will die. And one of these potential Buddhas, future Buddhas, he walks aside, walks across her path um, gives her his smell and she lunges at him and kills him and takes him back and gives him to be food to her cubs so they have a meal and they will live. This mother and her family are going to live. Fifty incarnations later, the second Buddha, the Buddha who preserved himself, you know, um, arrives finally, we'll call it, inside the gates of paradise. And the Buddha who gave himself to the tigress was already there from the moment he gave himself to the tigress. Like, you know, he was able to surrender selfhood. He was able to surrender it for the good of the tiger and the good of her cubs. And so he, in being able to surrender selfhood, became... Um, so if we could arrive at the point when we were willing to go beyond selfhood and to live beyond selfhood and the threat to selfhood, then we could accept the world in its danger and its terror. Then we could begin to develop a capacity for ordinariness, not modify the world, not change the world, not make the world better, not to wish the world was a new heaven and a new earth. I mean, it seems to me that... Easter morning happens inside of our eyes, that it isn't a new world we encounter in Easter morning. What we encounter in Easter morning is a new way of seeing the world we already exist in. And this new way of seeing the world, we see it as, in fact, paradisal. But it's a paradise in which the wolf is still a wolf, in which um, the tiger is still a tiger and burns bright in the forests of the night. But if you can live in such a way, like from the fairy story level of your mind, then the animals which will and still can and might well do, might devour you, they can also help you. I mean, the primeval can be on our side. You know, anaconda, which is a great constricting snake, can one day, like, become a canoe that takes me up the river. You know, so the anaconda that might constrict me and kill me, and might well do, um, can also become my canoe. That there's no level of my own psyche that can't, in a sense, help me, however primeval that level is, that can't be of assistance to me and be on my side. So if we could, in a sense, get into the side, get into the world. I mean, there's a Buddha, there's an old Taoist saying, saying which says that the ideal way to be in the world is to be to be blank as a piece of uncarved wood yet receptive as a hollow in the hills now i i desperately want to be me in my uniqueness and i want my features and i want my my looks and i want my particular height and i want all these kind of things like and that's my individual features that i've become identified with now supposing like you can imagine a carved piece of wood perfectly carved to represent someone and they're saying okay like can you can you retreat a little bit from that and be as blank as a piece of uncarved wood uh, like don't don't identify with your face don't identify with your appearance don't identify with your good looks or your bad looks or any of that like be as blank as a piece of uncarved wood yet receptive as a hollow in the hills because we talk about my 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 homo erectus shape now supposing that shape is is a limiting shape supposing the ideal shape for a human being to adopt supposing the great spiritual shape is to be a hollow in the hills to be like a coombe the horse's glen that's up from me in kerry because down into the hollow in the hills come all the rains, come all the heavens. Everything that the heavens can give is flowing down into that shape. So we're so concerned to be homo erectus, aren't we? Um, that very often, I mean, this thing flows away from us. I mean, we have no capacity anymore to receive what the heavens is forever trying to give us. And I can only receive what the heavens is forever attempting to give me if I become a hollow in the hills. So it seems to me that there is an Easter anyway in which we waken up to the extraordinary and there's an even greater Easter in which we waken up to the ordinary. And there are nights like when you'd say, um, 
Every night is Christmas night. Every night is Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Eve, when we are children, I hang up my stockings. I hang up two stockings, maybe, in the hope that Santa Claus, this man with a bag of miracles on his back, will come down and put wonders into my stockings, like, and they'll be there for me in the morning. Now, supposing that every night I'm still a child, even if I'm 60 years of age, I'm still a child, but the stocking that I hang up now tonight is my empty mind, and the other stocking I hang up is my empty heart and when I get up in the morning like my empty mind is full of miracles and wonders and splendors and ordinary things ordinary primroses and my my the the, the, the stocking of my heart is full of wonders and I open my mind I open my curtains to the miracle of ordinariness just to the miracle and wonder of ordinariness and that's enough that is the greatest of all Christmas mornings so our capacity for ordinariness is maybe some of the things we could look for on Easter morning Easter morning for a Christian is a great morning Easter morning for a Christian you can say that bright angel trail because of where Christ has walked in our trans destiny Christ because of where he has walked, Easter morning, on Easter morning, we can now claim and say that Bright Angel Trail is Isle. The Isle in a church, A-I-S-L-E is what I'm talking about. There's an Irish word, Isle in the Collie, Isle, which is uh, for cliff, a rock. But Bright Angel Trail is totally integrated now into our religion. Isn't that an astonishment? Um, you know that that we don't we can now walk bright angel trail in the footsteps of Christ and walk it with bright angel and walk it with Christ down to the floor of the canyon we can walk it downwards and upwards isn't that an astonishing gift to have been given that bright angel trail is now not outside the church it is within the church so that your journey from the front door to the altar is bright angel trail that has been integrated by Christ I mean, the noon of heavenly lightnings and the night of fire is now part of our inheritance. Conscious, consciously, it always was, but now we know consciously that it is part of our inheritance. God is saying that he has called us all to that kind of life of glory. We awaken to the, pos- to the fact that there is now a Christian religion the religion that is able for Bright Angel Trail. I mean, to belong in a religion, to wake up to a morning in which you can say, my religion is able for Bright Angel Trail. It is able for Bright Angel Trail because it has integrated Bright Angel Trail, because Bright Angel Trail has become high. Isn't that a most wonderful thing to wake up to? I wake up to the possibility, I, I think, like that on Easter morning, that um, there aren't only 15 mysteries in the Christian rosary. I mean, we talk about the joyful mysteries and sorrowful mysteries and the glorious mysteries and the Lord save us. You want to say, how can we go beyond glory? Like, I mean, but I think on Easter morning we wake up and find there are five mystical mysteries like as well. And the mystical mysteries are Jesus Grand Canyon deep in the world's karma, Jesus on the hill of the empty skull, Jesus looking down into the emptiness of the empty skull. Anosh my Jesu, I call him, you know, I mean, I've, I've been writing about these things, but I mean, the idea is that Heidegger says that in the age of the world's night, someone must endure the abyss. And there's a lovely Maidu story. The Maidu are Indians from California. Uh, they don't any longer exist. They have been destroyed as a tribe. But they had a, a story of origins in which uh, in the beginning there was darkness and there was only water and darkness and a raft came from the north and on it was Turtle, who is an Oshma, and a father of the secret society. And as they were there on this raft in the middle of nothingness, the water and the darkness, suddenly a being came down, let himself down on a rope from heaven and tied the, tied the rope to the mast of the raft and sat down and... Well, I mean, they weren't too pushed about talking to each other or anything much, but eventually Turtle said, when is there going to be land for the likes of me to crawl out on? You know, I've been in water all the time, like, when is there going to be land? And, and the, the being who's come down from, from above says, well, where am I going to get soil to make land from? And Turtle eventually says, well, I'll go over the side and go down to the floor of the abyss and I'll see if I can bring up some soil. So they tie a rock onto Turtle's hand and down he goes and he gets soil and he comes up but ah, oh, when he comes up to the top it's almost all washed out there's only little bits under his nails and but that's not that's not too bad um, um, 
the, the, the being who has come down from above puts his hand under his arm, gets a little knife there and scoops out little bits, morsels of soil from under the, the, the nails of Turtle. He rolls them into a ball, puts it on the raft on the, and comes the next morning and hasn't grown. He comes the following morning and has grown so that it's quite big. And then he comes on the third morning and it's as big as the whole world. Now, for the sake of the world, Turtle went down to the floor of the abyss and he brought up the soil from which the world emerged or from which the world grew and Heidegger says that in the age of the world's night in, and he would say that we are going through an age of the world's night in the age of the world's night someone must endure the abyss someone must, must it's as simple as that he says someone must endure the abyss in the age of the world's night now total endured the abyss and i'm saying that on good friday jesus endured the abyss he went into the darkness and he like total went over the side went to the floor of the abyss and he came up not with soil in the sense he came up with new seeing he came up with a, a new way of seeing the world that already existed what he what what came to him on the floor of the abyss was was this gift of seeing, this gift of, this capacity for ordinariness. So when I say that, that the first of the, of the mystical mysteries is Jesus' Grand Canyon deep in the world's karma, the second is Jesus looking on the hill of, of the empty skull, looking down into that empty skull, then there is Jesus as total, Jesus going down to the floor of the abyss, and they are acquiring a capacity to see the world as wonder, to see the ordinary world as wonder. And then there is Jesus coming ashore. I talk about Jesu and Anadiomene, Jesus coming ashore then from the abyss. And then there is Jesus preaching his first evangelanta sermon, preaching the new sermon, the new gospel, the new wonder. Like, So we wake up on Easter morning, not just to the fact that Bright Angel Trail is Isle, not just to the fact that Christianity is a religion that is able from Bright Angel Trail. We wake up with the capacity for ordinariness. We wake up um, with five new mystical mysteries in our rosary like so that and they are telling us that our destiny is bigger and larger than we have hitherto imagined it to be so there are all kinds of wonderful things ordinary things that we awaken to on Easter morning and the Buddhists, the Buddhists always talk about they don't talk about salvation much they talk about a great awakening and to awaken to what's already given. I'm not saying that that's the end, but until we awaken to what's already given, should we dare to yearn to awaken to what isn't yet given? You know, I think like the Christianity, at the heart of Christianity is the doctrine of the incarnation. And I think like that on Easter morning, we should learn to be incarnate and to endure and go through um, uh, the suffering and the joy and the plenitudes and the poverty of being incarnate. And if we are willing to be incarnate and continue to be incarnate, if we are willing to say that the best way to experience grace is to be willing to surrender and submit to gravity, I mean, gravity and grace are two different things like that. My, my willingness to surrender to gravity and the gravity of the universe and the earth and the world is, my, is, my, is in a sense like, not capitulation, but is my willingness to be incarnate and is my willingness to endure grace in that way. And if I am willing to surrender to gravity in that way, then when I say in excelsis, the, the word gloria in excelsis deo, I mean, glory to God in the highest, I mean, when I look down to the earth, then everything is in excelsis. I don't have to look up then to see excels in excelsis or life in excelsis. When I look down, I see life in excelsis. So to wake up an Easter morning and to be willing to acquire and to live with the capacity for ordinariness, if I think we are willing to acquire that capacity, then I think all that is extraordinary will also be given to us. But I think it might be illegitimate to want to arrive in heaven before we've ever set foot on the earth. I think we should first learn to set foot on the earth. And that when Jesus arrived on Easter morning in the Garden of the Sepulchre or on the shore of Turia to home, he was setting foot on the earth in a way that no one had ever set foot on the earth. 
I mean, it seems to me that the process of becoming incarnate completed itself an Easter morning. Um, that he became totally incarnate. Jesus didn't become totally incarnate in Bethlehem or even in Gethsemane. He did. But, I mean, he came back into that incarnation on Easter morning and was willing for for whatever length. It doesn't matter for how long. So long as you're willing to be incarnate and to give the ordinary world a chance and to let the ordinary world be the means of grace to you, a world that is dangerous, a world that is terrifying, Um, to wake up in that world and to be have a capacity for that way of being awake is, it seems to me, great blessedness. If we learn this, then I think we might one day also be granted our noon of heavenly lightnings or our night of fire. The important thing is that we get back home to divine ground And I think we discover, having got back to divine ground, that we really never left home. This is the astonishing thing. There's nothing outside of God. Um, There's a wonderful thing in in the Kabbalah where it says someone, if I remember it rightly, was given a vision. Some old mystic will say was given a vision to look into the seven heavens. And everywhere in the seven heavens he saw God. And he was given a vision to look into the seven levels of the earth. And everywhere in the seven levels of the earth he saw God. Then he was given a vision to look into the seven abysses. And in every one of those abysses he saw God. And I think that's wonderful. Like in every one of the abysses he saw God. So when I cry out of the depths, I cry unto thee, O Lord. There is a sense in which I'm saying, God, it's out of your depths that I'm crying to you. Because my depths are in some sense your your depths. My depths aren't an outer darkness outside of you. I'm outside of you, yes, I am outside of you. But in being outside of you, I'm still within you, do you know? My my experience of outsidedness is an experience of outsidedness within the being in some way of God or within the grace of God. I mean, this is heavy theological territory now that I'm in. But in a sense, yeah, I am in exile and I feel that I'm outside. But that experience of outsidedness is all within God. And all I have to do is wake up from that sense of being outside and I am experiencing by Easter, I am within God. In the seven in the seven heavens, God, in the seven levels of earth, God, and in the seven abysses, God. Isn't that wonderful? Like so out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. I can almost retranslate that and say, out of thy depths out of me experiencing those depths as exiled depths, out of those depths, out of thy depths, I cry unto thee, O Lord. We live, move, and have our being in God. And we talk about our journey to God. But all day I have been talking about God's journey to us because God's journey to us is a journey through Gethsemane and Good Friday and Easter. And we met him on Easter morning. And to know that as we as we sink into abysses and sink into the Gethsemanes and sink into the Good Fridays on our journey home to God, that in a sense, that's God journeying to us. That's great good news on Easter morning. God is journeying to us. Can we accept that? It's Easter morning. Hang up your empty heart and hang up your empty mind and open your curtains and say, God, God bless you.